You've also talked about the need for changing the economic structure as far as celebrating the GDP and the numbers yeah. being up, that that's the model that we, we don't need to be celebrating mass production and consumption. Can you talk to that? The problem that I see is that uh, economists consider the things that happen in nature uh, an externality. So if you say, Mr. Economist, plot the economy for you. Oh, they'll show raw materials, extraction, process, manufacture with arrows going back and forth. But if you say, well, where does the ozone layer fit in that? Or deep underground aquifers of fossil water, or topsoil or biodiversity, they say those are externalities. That means they're not in the economy. And what struck me many years ago, we were involved in a battle over a forest called the Stein Valley, where native people considered this a sacred valley, and a logging company had been given permission by the government to log it. And I went into the valley, we were protesting against the logging, and I met the CEO of the company. And we had this huge argument. And finally he said, listen Suzuki, you're a tree hugger, you want to save that tree, are you willing to pay money so that we don't cut that tree down? Because if you're not willing to pay money for that, it doesn't have any value until someone cuts it down. And I thought, oh my God, he's right. You see, that tree, as long as it's standing there and alive, it's taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting oxygen back in it. That's not a bad service for us. That's an externality. The roots hold the soil so when it rains, it doesn't erode and wash into the salmon spawning beds and, and erode away. That's an externality. The, the tree takes hundreds of gallons of water, pumps it up through transpiration out of the leaves, and affects weather and climate. That's an externality. The tree provides habitat to, to insects and fungi and birds and, and mammals. That's an externality. So in the economic system, none of those things that living tree is doing have any value. And that's the problem that we face, is that economists think that the most important thing is us. We're so productive and creative, and <coughs> we then are the very basis of the economy. And nature's services are externalities. And to compound the problem, they think that, that the economy can grow forever, which it cannot. Nothing in, in a fixed world, the biosphere, can grow forever. But economists think not only that it's possible, but that it's necessary. So the very definition of progress becomes, did the economy grow last year? You can't grow anything for, I mean, you think we have 60 trillion cells in our bodies. One cell decides it's going to be a cancer cell. There are 60 trillion cells out there. What's one little itty bitty cell? So that cell thinks, well, I can just keep dividing and dividing and dividing and divide forever. Well, you know it doesn't happen. Even though there are 60 trillion cells, it'll kill us. And yet we've developed an economic system that is based on the concept that growth forever is possible and necessary. And then no one asks, how much is enough? Okay, you've got two cars in your garage. Will you be happy with four? What, do we, what, what does it take? The average size of a house is increasing by 500 square feet every 20 years, and yet the average number of people living in the house is dropping steadily. How much is enough? This whole idea that more and more is what makes us happy and is necessary is at the heart of the problem we're facing. We are, are using up the planet's life support systems and I think very, very few people would say having more stuff is what really makes me happy.